You know, it strikes me that the viewing issue with manufacturing facilities, because of the size, because of the sort of multiple stakeholders, you've probably got multiple people on site who want access to the cameras. You've got, probably got multiple people off site who want access to the cameras. It's one of those things that it does really behoove you to think at the beginning and start planning out, not just what is the system going to do, but who is using it and how are they using it. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of In the Trenches Roundtable. This one we're going to be discussing manufacturing. Um, there's a lot of interesting things about manufacturing. We've got security needs, we've got um, safety concerns with when it comes to security, but also some non-traditional security requirements like being able to view assembly lines. Um, and as usual, we have a great panel to discuss it with. Um, first, I have our CEO, Micah Shearer. Hello. Next, I have our director of sales, Ben LaRue. Hey, everyone. And last but not least, we have our CEO, Matthew Nederlanden. Hey, everybody. All right, so kind of one of the first things um, I would just got ask is, what, what, what should the manufacturer know about kind of traditional security um, coverages for theft and, and all that kind of stuff? Definitely, that's, a, that's all right. I'll go ahead and just jump right in. I think some of the first questions I would like to ask um, and some considerations to have in mind would definitely be, are we retrofitting this facility? Is there existing uh, equipment that's in place now? What does that existing equipment look like? Uh, maybe what type is it? Those type of things. Um, and if we are not retrofitting and this is maybe a new build or a pre-construction project, then really um, trying to get all of the key players you know, the, uh, the people pivotal and making sure all the decisions are made in terms of camera locations or access control, doors, things like that um, happen well in advance of these things actually getting built. Um, but typically that's where I like to start my conversations when we talk to, uh, you know, manufacturing facilities. Yeah, I mean, I would, I would want to balance between both the, the camera needs in order to, to get accurate surveillance of, of the plant um, and also the access control needs. I would, I would really think that access control would be something that would be uh, highly desired for uh, the security needs for a manufacturing plant. Um, you know, usually you've got a lot of bodies coming in and out. Just the rekeying costs alone when you have turnover, which is also a little bit more uh, frequent with manufacturing. Um, you know, the rekeying costs alone is going to easily pay, you know, not having that expense is going to easily pay for. Uh, the access control, um, you know, uh, uh, residual monthly bills. Um, and so using something like, like our cloud-based access control with OpenPath, uh, you're going to be able to manage that uh, through an app. You're going to be able to have people wave in front of a door uh, with their cell phone uh, and be able to open the door without ever having to issue keys for somebody. Uh, I think that, that that would be, you know, something that I would, I would really want to start with with manufacturing. Let's start with access control. We usually start with cameras. I love the idea of starting with access control. Can somebody give me like a, a the best 60 second explanation on what access control is and what does it bring to a manufacturer? I mean, in terms of functionally, access control is simply, can I allow certain individuals to unlock a door versus other individuals to unlock a door? It's the management and distribution of credentials, essentially. And there are lots and lots of ways you do that. You know, the archaic is... You know, you've got a key that's sort of the archaic analog, um, but typically with an access control system, you've got, you know, anything from key fobs to credentials on your phone. Um, I love the wave to unlock that open path allows where the phone's in my pocket. I have access to that door. I just wave at the reader and walk in. Um, so that's sort of the, the crux of the functionality. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Even, not, even beyond that, a modern access control system, despite something like a key, allows me to act, allow me to grant access uh, on certain conditions. So, mm -hmm. you know, my employees can come in Monday through Friday from nine to five, but they can't come in on the weekend, you know, and you right. can never do that with a key. It allows you to be incredibly granular in how you control that access and flexible as well. And as Matt mentioned, the issues of rekeying, the nice thing about a modern cloud-based system is I can turn credentials on and I can turn credentials off without having to interact with a person or physically interact with the door. Um, I don't know if folks remember sort of some old school days where you had to literally plug something up to the reader and program it 
in order or the controller in order to change credentials. Um, and especially, I mean, if you're dealing with multiple locations and you're dealing with turnover and change, that is just an absolute nightmare and you don't have to do it anymore. Yeah. Absolutely. Who's not dealing with turnover and change right now? <laughs> I, just, I, I heard shift. I heard time there. Does, does that mean you could potentially, you know, manufacturers have, sometimes they're operating 24 seven. Usually they have at least one or two, two different shifts. Um, can you grant access by shifts or anything like that or? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you can get as granular as uh, granting access per door uh, on per user. So if there are certain employees that shouldn't be in certain areas after certain times, like maybe we don't want the manufacturing floor workers to be accessing the admin offices during the you know second or third shift. Well, we could restrict their access into those you know parts of the building during those times if we wanted to. You know, that's what access control gives you the ability to do. It's the electrifying the ability to manipulate and control access to any given door on a per user basis. So uh, yeah, the, you know, the use cases and applications for access control and how it can be used in a manufacturing facility is imperative to increasing the efficiencies of the production. And that's all manufacturing is. And I'm sure, you know, someone like Micah, our CEO gets that, right? Operational <laughs> efficiencies are huge. Um, and that's the, that's the name of the game in manufacturing. So access control directly can affect that. And not to mention the, the, even the life safety issues. You know, sometimes you have manufacturers that, that house tons of dangerous chemicals that could be used for all sorts of reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes they house dangerous chemicals that just could hurt one of their own employees. Uh, and so being able to make sure that the right people have right the right access to the right areas, uh, I think is is paramount to the manufacturing industry. Uh, obviously, we're you know primarily a surveillance company, uh, and we'll get to that. But I, I can't stay overstate how important proper levels of access control are. The right people in the right areas at the right times. Um, right. And before we go industry. any further on on access control and some of the use cases, I think it might be important just to in a very bare bones sense, break down what access control really even is. And I think, you know, the easiest way to look at it is there's like three main components. You know, there's the controller, that's really the brains of the system and what interacts with and actually physically unlocks and locks things. And that speaks to the two other components, the readers, that's the second component. That's what you're actually scanning your either key cards or in open paths case with Bluetooth enabled way of to unlock features using your phone. So first controllers, second readers, and the third component is that locking hardware on the physical door itself. Um, yeah, and and so, that could be something like an electrified strike or it could be a mag lock, you know, 400 pounds above the door. Uh, there's a bunch exactly. of different ways you can lock the door. Exactly. So that, that brings up my question, you know, we've talked about the benefits of access control. What is the, the installation or even the what, do you, what are the first questions you're asking? What, what do people need to know about access control? What information do they need to get to you in order for that to, um, to start a quote and, and get the process rolling? And I think expectation setting is important for an, for an access control system because it, um, it is labor intensive to install mm -hmm. and there are um, additional complexities that you don't have with a camera system. With a camera system, I've got a brain, the MVR, and I've got a cable, and I've got the camera. With an access control system, I've got the controller, the brain, I've got the reader, which is sort of like the sensor that is, you know, taking that information in, and I've got the door hardware. Um, and the door hardware is incredibly varied. <laughs> Doors are incredibly varied. Um, so you have a lot that goes into understanding what door hardware you need, what you can use, what's going to serve the, your particular use case. And you also have an additional layer of life safety concerns, um, mm -hmm. more in a, a technical sense than what Matt referenced earlier as far as like chemicals, but life safety in the sense of the fire marshal is going to come um, inspect that door and make sure that you're not locking people inside the building <laughs> in the case of emergency. Um, so I, I think having some expectations that it's a process, there's a lot of questions that will have to be asked and answered and planning the system out, um, understanding budget requirements that, you know, and a, a brand new access control system with hardware included, I mean, you can range from $3,000 in the very low end all the way up to five or $6,000, depending on how complex you're getting or what kind of doors you're working with. Um, so all that to say, just lots of variables to pre be prepared 
to sort of dig in, to be asked really good questions, to have to gather information from other sources um, and, and walk through that process. Yeah, and Micah hit a couple notes there talking about life safety and getting fire marshal uh, mm -hmm. to sign off on different things based on different codes in your jurisdiction. And there's a term that will be often used that should be mentioned immediately when access control is brought up, and that's AHJ, the authority that has jurisdiction in your mm -hmm. given county or jurisdiction. Uh, that's going to be the person that we're going to have to coordinate with in terms of the life safety and making sure that the system is working and functioning properly during an emergency event. Um, yeah, there's sort of overarching codes, NEC basically, that um, everybody tends to follow, but then individual AHJs um, can layer additional requirements over top of exactly. those. And we have to be aware of that and make sure that everybody's in compliance. Exactly. So what you're and saying is basically, I have to obey my state rules, but also my municipality uh, and perhaps even my city. And uh, correct. And, and depending on the manufacturing you do, it, you know, you there might be specific regulations or codes specific mm -hmm. to the manufacturing you do. You know, if there's maybe some chemicals, you know, there's a whole host of different things that can come into play there. It's really important to have that communication and coordination with the client, ourselves being the security advisors here, and then the AHJ uh, coming together and making sure the solution works. And we take a little more time when we quarterback an access control project to identify a local technical group that really does have the resources and know what they're doing. Um, and if we don't have that group, we'll be honestly, we'll be direct and honest with folks that we don't we don't have a contact that we feel comfortable um, implementing this because it is complex. So you should always ask a lot of really good questions of whatever group you um, you're contracting with. Totally. And to Micah's original point, setting expectations, these projects take a long time and, you know, for a reason, because we want to make sure it's done right. And so should you. And if it's done right, then that's one thing you don't have to worry about that you can officially cross off the list. Um, yeah. If uh, a camera goes down, you lose footage and that really sucks and can ruin your day. If a door is set up wrong and somebody's locked in in the middle of emergency, that's an entirely different level of catastrophe. Exactly. So if I'm understanding right with with access control. We got life safety, which you know involves hey, if there's a fire in this building, uh, another kind of emergency. How do people get out of the building? You know how are how are, how are systems inter interconnected? Um, so when it, and we're talking about a lot of complexity here, you know that that that's this isn't an item that we do do yourself, correct? This is we have to professional. No, you need that. to have a professional in there, especially if you're in manufacturing. So. Uh, typically, like if you're in an office building, uh, most access control is going to be what's called a fail uh, uh, safe setup. In other words, like if we lose power, all the doors are going to unlock. If there's a fire, all the doors are going to unlock. It's called fail safe. Um, and so if there is a failure within the building, it's going to be safe for everybody to exit. Uh, on the flip side, though, every once in a while with, with manufacturing that's dealing with something that might be used for terrorism or might be used for uh, really dangerous situations where somebody could come in and get it. So let's say, uh, you know, think of like nuclear power plant. Uh, they don't use that. They use a thing called fail secure. You lose power, everybody's locked down. Uh, and that's because they don't want what's in there to get out. Um, and so there are a couple of things of what we need to know what you're manufacturing. We need to know your jurisdiction rules uh, on, on what to do in certain emergency levels. Um, and so there is a lot more complexity uh, than a camera system um, in terms of regulations and uh, bylaws and et cetera. Um, but, you know, like I said, right from the start, though, like we'll handle all of that. If we've got a good resource in that area, we'll handle all of that for you uh, and figure it all out. Um, and we will partner with you and, and yeah. work figuring all that out. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, but uh, I would absolutely approach any sort of manufacturing first and foremost from, you know, making sure that we have good access control system in place, because what you're manufacturing needs to be needs to be protected uh, mm -hmm. from a physical access uh, ability. Definitely. And James, going back to your original first question, like what are some things to consider when we start looking at access control? Really, the first question I would always look to ask is. Uh, Again, going back to that idea, if are we retrofitting or is this, you know, coming up net new, um, you know, if we're retrofitting, do you have an existing access control in place? 
or did the facility that you're taking over have some type of access control system in place? Because although the legacy style access control is now you know, somewhat very outdated, the components, the locking hardware, the Why? cable to the readers, exactly, the uh, controller location, a lot of those things will stay the same. Maybe we just have to swap out some of the components or maybe we could look into what components need refreshing, right? Mm -hmm. um, but that is a totally different animal and story compared to you have control over the physical doors that are gonna be put in place there. Um, you know, let's work with a door hardware company to source that locking hardware, make sure it's electrified from that company, those type of things, right? So that's kind of how I approach it and see, you know, what type of knowledge, what type of understanding do we have over your current facility in terms of door type, maybe existing equipment, so on and so forth. And if it, what if it is a new one and you're just checking to see, you know, how many doors you have and kind of coming up with a plan of like who can access what, uh, how early is that planning going on? Yeah, you also pretty... need to know a little bit about your doors because you're always sort of retrofitting to the door. Well, uh, I was so... going to say before that, you need to, we need to know, are the doors there or are they coming? Are you ordering the doors? If the doors are there and they don't have electrified hardware, then we need to start there. What type of door is it? How does it close? Does it have an automatic close arm? Mm -hmm. All these things are going to tell us what locking hardware we can use, which will further inform us what type of access and control we can have. Yeah, any, anything else you think anybody should know about access control? Um, I, it seems like it's a, a must-have for a manufacturing plant. Um, you know, of course, manufacturers vary from producing thousands of things a day to, you know, people across the river who are making, you know, <laughs> plates. You know, that, uh, that's technically manufacturing. So, um, obviously, each one's going to have a different need for that. If you got life safety involved, we probably need to, you know, have a discussion um, and, and talk about that. But anything else you guys think about access control before we move on to general surveillance or video surveillance? My only last thing I would say is the earlier you can do this in the facility, the better, right? So um, uh, if we can influence and have the ability to implement access control the moment you take over this new facility or the moment you're thinking about building this facility, the easier things are in the long run. And to Matt's point earlier, the costs, although they might seem great initially for access control, over the lifetime of the facility, of this asset, uh, your costs will be significantly less than compared to rekeying every time you have term turnover. And every single time you have, you have turnover, uh, you really need to rekey the door. That gets unbelievably expensive with uh, when you start hitting a critical mass of you know, more than 20 employees. Uh, 20 employees, whatever, maybe you don't have a lot of turnover. Uh, but as soon as you start having, you know, in, in what manufacturer has less than 20 employees? Um, you know, so like once you start hitting a critical mass of like at least 20, the cost per year of rekeying the door when you have turnover versus the cost of just paying for the subscription to manage the cloud account, it, it vastly goes into your favor. So kind of the one of the main things is the initial cost, maybe you may get some sticker shock out of access control, but the total cost of ownership as time goes on, you know, you'll start to see a lot of benefits from not having to rekey or um, the other benefits of, you know, the safety it's going to bring to your, your plant and everything. Um, does that seem about right? Definitely, yeah, I would say. There's also time savings administratively of, you know, you're not tracking down people and tracking down physical objects and assigning things to them necessarily, but you can still use a key fob. Um, but, you know, everybody has a smartphone. You can give people temporary credentials. You can centralize the management of that. So you're not, you know, dealing with that, like, hey, I can't get in the building call. Um, so there's definitely a time savings administratively. Talk to me a little bit about the, the smartphone, because most people who, who who do access control or they know it as, oh, it's that badge thing I have to wear on uh, my neck and I have to, you know, go and put it right there. Um, what, how does that, like, that seems pretty new. What is that? How does that work? 
Um, I mean, basically you have the application on your phone and I have credentials tied to that application and tied to this phone. So I literally just, if my phone's in my pocket or my bag, I walk up to the door, I wave my hand in front of the reader, it identifies my phone is there and I walk in. Um, I recently had, I, I needed somebody to be able to come pick up something from the office and I was able to send them a one day guest pass. Like anytime that day you can go to the office, I sent it straight to their phone. They came in, they came out, it was super easy. Um, and I didn't have to deal with that. Like, hey, I'm stuck in the building. Can somebody come meet me, et cetera. You know, time mm -hmm. suck. Mm -hmm. And yeah. is that secure? You know, I'm, smartphones, are they? I don't know. <laughs> it, it is so much more secure than the key fob. Uh, so mm -hmm. the key fobs using technology called RFID uh, for the vast majority of key fobs. Uh, and it's really easy to duplicate what it's sending out there. So the, the, the reader has to read what it's transmitting. Um, Not to mention how so, easy it is to lose that fob or, yep. you know, somebody lift that fob. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's just sending out the credentials and they have to be able to be read and you can just copy what it sends out. Uh, there's devices that, that thieves buy that where you wave a key card in front of it and spits out another key card that does the exact same thing. Um, key cards are not a good way of doing this. Uh, the way, the you know, more modern way with, with the app is so much more secure. I do want to point out that there is a key card available for uh, OpenPath and it is actually encrypted. Um, but the vast majority of the industry's key cards are not. Uh, so we do have a key card option if you want that, uh, but mm -hmm. it is encrypted. Uh, it doesn't mean that everybody's cards are encrypted. So the vast majority of them are not. Well. Sounds like we've covered a lot of access control. Um, how about we talk about video surveillance? Oh, is that what we're here to do? Yeah. <laughs> Come on. I, I forgot. forgot. I kind of I kind of hijacked the me. discussion to make sure Dang. that we covered that. I think <laughs> it's very important. I, I think it seems like something that I agree with you as far as seems like something that you want to start out earlier in the planning. Um, you know, because mm -hmm. you probably know what how many doors you have early enough, right? So. Um, whereas, you know, video surveillance, you, you've got a lot that may need to be built around to understand like, okay, this office is going to be somebody else's office. So access control does seem like a good starting place. But um, now we kind of covered that. Yeah, video surveillance, like, what are we looking for for that? And you, we talked about retrofitting versus new. What, mm -hmm. what about, what are you looking at for that, Ben? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I definitely think, you know, there's a couple different approaches to take. We can always and will always look at using surveillance and even access control as a security measure, right? As a physical security measure um, for all the things that you could think of of security in the asset that you have at this facility. Um, but much more than that, especially in manufacturing, the line of sight that access control and surveillance gives you, uh, specifically surveillance into your day-to-day -day operations into what is actually physically happening in this facility, when it's happening, what's taking place, who's being safe, who isn't. Um, those are some of the bigger, bigger considerations, even outside of, you know, physical security, you know, cameras over the entrances of the doors, uh, cameras, uh, license plate cameras on the parking lot or the gates to enter the parking lot, you know, things like this totally makes sense from a security standpoint, um, but cameras, to cover the manufacturing floor, high volume areas, a lot of people coming and going, any area where there's machinery interacting with humans, you know, you're definitely gonna wanna have coverage there and uh, you know, large general coverage in those areas. Um, anytime you have operating, operated machinery like forklifts or floor jacks, you need to have coverage and cameras there. So. Surveillance is much more than just security in manufacturing. And I think we should definitely look at surveillance through that lens. It's a great point. I think, you know, if you're, when we talk about surveillance, a lot of people think like, like you know, at a gas station, they know it's there because we're trying to prevent shoplifting. Manufacturing has so much going on. Um, I think you hit some good ones there. Um, what about some other concerns that they're going to have for the video surveillance can help with? I think, let me hammer something a little bit more. I say this, you know, almost every one of these industry videos, but we have a, th a thought process as a sort of person who goes places and it gets observed by cameras. And we think like that the majority of the use case of cameras is to do things like stop theft or, uh, you know, deal with vandalism or any sort of these crime based problems. Um, and I think that we need to escape that here. 
the <laughs> the orbit of that is so strong that everybody tends to think about it that way. But the <laughs> problem with a manufacturing plant is not going to be somebody coming in and stealing something. That's not going to put you out of business. Mm -mm. But if you have a manufacturing defect in your machinery that produces six weeks of bad equipment that you cannot sell, and then you find out about it six weeks later, that is potentially ending your operation. If you're sitting here and saying, I've got I've to figure out how to get offload, you know, 900 widgets that don't, that don't work uh, because I've been manufacturing them for six weeks and, you know, none of them are effective. Um, and so things like being able to observe if a machinery is doing what it's supposed to be doing, uh, being able to uh, look into, you know, did it even have a, a breakage or a stoppage, you know, uh, uh, like a paper printer where it's just like not going through it anymore, um, mm -hmm. you know, or anything that prevents the operation of the business. Uh, your biggest risk of anything to your business uh, is is preventing its own operation. Uh, and so uh, that is, I think, one of the biggest needs of any sort of surveillance system like this is to be able to watch the, the delicate machinery that could be broken and understanding and observing where it is or, or where it's having problems um, from a visual standpoint. Uh, and there might be multi layers where you, you observe this. You might have some sort of sensor system you get from somebody else or something like that. Um, but being able to visually check on that. So the sensor has reported to me, you know, uh, increased vibration on this, on this device, being able to visually look at it um, by a staff member that may not be at that location uh, mm -hmm. is invaluable. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, Matt, you, you hammer home on a point that is you know, often overlooked by manufacturing facilities and production facilities. Having cameras on production lines or on equipment in the production uh, process where humans can't be, right? Think of all the places on a production line where humans interact with the line in some sense, or they might go and walk by and check. There are places where humans can't get that cameras can. And having cameras with a high frame rate, ability to see you know, minute details like tags or stickers or, or, or numbers or sequences of things, you know, all that goes into play with that. You're exactly well, right. And on the oversight topic, I mean, just a lot of manufacturing facilities are so large, like you can't be in all the places with any sort of frequency. So being able to, to have the, the option of just popping in across the entire facility is invaluable. Oh, absolutely. Furthermore, if you have an accident uh, with a forklift, uh, you know, potentially backing into something or, um, you know, worst case scenario, you know, a hur hurting or harming a human situation, you know, these type of investigations halt all operations at plants for days, weeks, potentially, mm -hmm. until it's, you know, um, uh, verified by all, you know, the parties involved. And, and then, I mean, of course, you've got the security benefits as well. You know, shrinkage is unfortunately a issue at manufacturing and production facilities. You know, I, I like telling the story as much as I can. Uh, we work with the manufacturing facility that does um, apple juice and uh, apple products. And they uh, called me up during the middle of the pandemic when it was really, really crazy. Um, when things really started to, to, to hit their peak, um, needing more coverage of their storage rooms, their equipment storage rooms. And I just inquired and in why that was. That's kind of an odd place to, you know, really focus on putting a lot of cameras. And he uh, informed me he could not justify the cost, the increased cost of toilet paper because of how much was being stolen. Um, you know, so shrinkage, whether it be on the actual product or raw material you're making or simple supplies that you're storing, um, <laughs> you know, it's a real thing. You know, it's a real thing. So if, if I can sum up a little bit, what I'm hearing is the benefits of video surveillance are we've got obviously like general coverage of, of your, your manufacturing floor and, and general area as well. Um, we've got the, uh, the ability to see things we may not even be able to see with, with you know, normal access and, um, but also, you know, the, the general um, safety the the workman's comp issues the making sure everyone's kind of where they should be and, and where they need to be um the, one of the things you guys mentioned was being able to view the manufacturing line with these cameras like how 
what kind of equipment are you going to need? Is that, is that going to be a uh, different, it's going to be probably pretty specific use, right? It's going to depend on what machinery you have, you know? So let's say you've got uh, something that's very rapidly moving uh, machinery. Um, you're going to want a camera with a really high shutter speed, be able to observe if there's, there's something, you know, that's, that's going wrong with that process. So going back to the, you know, the paper manufacturing, you know, typically comes down the line, goes into basically in a circle, comes back out, um, you know, and it does that really quickly because paper is very cheap and we need to make a lot of it per second if we're going <laughs> to be cost effective uh, at making it. Uh, and so you need something with a really fast frame rate in order to see that. Um, but in addition to that, we also know to know certainly some things that uh, may or may not be obvious visually. Like, is it making a big clanging noise? Well, that's a problem. But how do I know that? Um, well, so you probably want a camera with, uh, you know, an, uh, with, uh, that can record audio. Uh, and then you probably want to run like an analytic that uh, looks for you know, big giant changes in decibel level. So is it you know, soft, 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 loud? Um, so problem. Uh, or potential problem, you know, in some scenario like that. Um, on the flip side, uh, we just did an, a deal, and hopefully, Ben, you can speak to this one, uh, where uh, it had something to do with cranes. We had to have that, this whole Wi-Fi based solution uh, because there's no way to, you know, the cameras are literally moving around on these cranes, um, you know, uh, but totally different equipment requiring a totally different, uh, you know, um, uh, solution from the hardware standpoint yeah absolutely yeah um that's a perfect example of it really depends on what you're trying to capture and what you're trying to cover um and in in that case that Matt just spoke to you know they were manufacturing steel right and uh they have track cranes that move throughout their facility and they needed to have line of sight directly on how the crane is interacting with the steel and you know essentially who and what is gonna be in its way at any given point in time. Um, you know, previous solutions that they were trying to use and implement, you know, were costing them upwards of $3,500 per camera, uh, two cameras on a crane. You've got 36 facilities across the country. You can do some math there, it gets pretty expensive quickly, you know, with some simple Wi-Fi based IP cameras, we were able to solve the problem for, for you know, exponentially less, but, um, yeah, I think that's a great example. I'll also say Should a consideration- Should the average manufacturing facility expect that they can use Wi-Fi based cameras? <laughs> Absolutely not. Really depends <laughs> on- the, No, it, it depends on- I'm big on the expectations that I can know, apparently. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Well, it, it, there's so many variables. You know, it, it's something that would have to be tested in a proof of concept, absolutely, before there's any commitments made on, on either side. You know, Wi-Fi wi based cameras are not the answer for anything, um, mm -hmm. unless they have to be. So, uh, you know, I'll blanketly say that. They're and not again, the first choice. No. Yeah, I mean, your first and, choice should, should always be to wire something. You know, yes. it doesn't matter if you're talking about servers or you're talking about cameras. Uh, if you want to make sure the data gets there. Exactly. Uh, from point A to point B, a wire is your most effective solution. Uh, yeah. Incidentally, also, you got to figure out how to power the thing. And usually that's over that same wire. So you're already usually running something. In this mm -hmm. particular case, you got a crane that's moving around but it does have power attached to it already. Mm -hmm. uh, and therefore the wire with the wireless Wi-Fi solution, uh, you know, with a wall plug, uh, obviously the camera still needs to be powered somehow, uh, mm -hmm. was actually a good solution. And that's not normally the case. Normally right. uh, yeah. you want to wire things up and you want to have things stationary, but normally you're not dealing with like a crane that's moving all around. Um, <laughs> exactly, exactly. And I need to go stick a camera on. Right. And another consideration in terms of manufacturing or production line cameras is really the lighting. You know, a lot of the situations or areas where you might be wanting to see something uh, or a piece of machinery, it could be in maybe a not well lit area or um, an area with variable lighting that maybe is changing often. Um, and so these are all things, again, that we're going to have to consider, you know, exposure, aperture settings. These type of things will be, you know, mission critical to ensuring that you're actually getting what you're, what you're wanting from. So I'm hearing like a lot of eye in the sky discussion here. Like, where do you, where are people actually going to even view these cameras? Is it, you know, do they connect to a screen or, or how do they do that? That's a great question. Lots yeah. of options. Yeah. <laughs> where yeah. do you want to view? So the many cameras? options. <laughs> yep. 
Exactly. I, the easiest way to boil it down, though, uh, for anyone who you know wants to know the options, you've got three main options. You can interact with the system directly uh, from a video output on the recording device, the network video recorder itself. So, so all the monitor camera. and mouse. Mm -hmm. Exactly. You can you know do that in multiple ways. You can have uh, video wall display set up. Uh, in some cases, you could have just a single monitor. You know, there's there's tons of options there, but you've got direct connection. That's kind of the way I like to phrase that. Uh, another option would be through the desktop or laptop software, SCW View Station. You could do that locally at the facility on the network or remotely, depending on how you all want to interact with it that way. Um, and they're different considerations and limitations on the desktop option. If you're doing it locally, you have to think through the bandwidth that you are pulling into that computer and how that's going to affect the network that's set up there. If you're doing it remotely, you've got to really think about your upload speed and what those limitations and considerations are going to be. Apologies for cutting you off before option three. <laughs> no, no, that's, that's absolutely right. Uh, option three quickly is just a, an application on your you know, phone, Android, iPhone. Smart, smart or, phone app. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Which um, doesn't, you're, you're still dealing with upload speed because a lot of times it's a substream. It's a much, uh, it's like a, you know, your phone's this big, so it's not pulling, it doesn't need to pull in all of the data. So it brings you a lower resolution version just so you can figure out what's going on. Um, it You don't hit the same challenges with upload speed, though you, you can, it kind of, it still depends. You still have to have a certain threshold. Incidentally, Absolutely. that's also what YouTube is doing right now. Um, so if you're watching this on a desktop, you're seeing a higher quality video in most cases uh, than if you're viewing on a smartphone. It's delivering you the uh, video size that fits on your device mm -hmm. and looking at, hey, how is my cell phone connection? Do I have a lot of reception? Things like that to give you the appropriate size video that your connection can handle from a, a data transmit perspective, um, mm -hmm. you know, both from your upload and, and from the download speed. Uh, and the cameras kind of do that as well, although it's you can do it a little more manually, uh, where YouTube is only automatic. Uh, you know, it strikes me that the viewing issue with manufacturing facilities, because of the size, because of the sort of multiple stakeholders, you've probably got multiple people on site who want access to the cameras. You've got, probably got multiple people off site who want access to the cameras. It's one of those things that it does really behoove you to think at the beginning and start planning out, not just what is the system going to do, but who is using it and how are they using it? Um, we've definitely run into situations where we hit the end of the project and they're like, oh, so everybody wants to view the cameras in their office. And we're like, oh, so cameras move a lot of data. <laughs> Let's we have to talk through this. Right. Um, we end up trying to like retro, almost retrofit our own project at the end with a solution. Um, and you can do it. There are lots, you know, there are lots of ways to skin the cat. There are lots of options. Um, but it, it's a more complex conversation, I think, than people always anticipate that it's going to be. So it, seem, it seems like it's a system in itself. That's what I'm kind of hearing from that. Mm. Like there's things to consider with it. Does that sound pretty it's right? It's a way of or? thinking about it, yeah. Absolutely, it should 100% be thought of uh, in the, from the beginning, from the initial conversations of the uh, video system. You need to be thinking about where our cameras placed, what are they looking, what are they covering, and then how am I interacting with it? How am I seeing mm -hmm. that? Mm -hmm. um, Cause you know, there's plenty of applications in cases where, you know, Michael, we actually just dealt with a client where they needed, you know, specific viewing stations per, mm -hmm. per you know, isolated areas throughout the, the manufacturing facility where, well, let's, you know- let's talk about one of those. Let's talk about one of those. Yeah. So a lot of big manufacturing have somebody who sits in a seat called a you know, something similar to a chief safety officer. You know, mm -hmm. their job is to make sure that, hey, are you wearing that hard hat uh, or uh, the appropriate gloves for your work or work boots, uh, et cetera. Um, and pre sort of any sort of system like, you know, uh, a surveillance system that could do some of this work, uh, you'd have one of those on each sort of location, then they're not a chief, they're bringing you know, some sort of local secure safety officer. Um, that is observing to make sure that people are following the correct protocols. Um, the nice thing about a video surveillance system is you can centralize that. So let's say you've got eight locations. You could have somebody working on this from video perspective uh, and viewing, you know, people coming and going, um, people on the on the uh, on the work line, uh, and being able to 
you know, report back to a direct manager rather than somebody having to do this on location. Um, and so you could have this sort of centralized person that, that is sending messages to local management uh, about the safety issues rather than uh, having to have a per location person that's, that's tasked with checking this sort of thing. Um, and you know, th that's just one of the many ways that you might use this sort of uh, viewing station um, in a centralized manner uh, in a way that is not the same as maybe you know, a different industry. There's no real need for that in an office setting, for example. Um, and so this would be a little a specific use case that we would probably need to understand from you to factor into uh, the network design on how are you going to be viewing this from a you know, chief safety officer perspective, from a operational perspective, who's watching when, uh, how many sort of view stations do we need to set up? Uh, yeah. And how do we plan the network to make sure it's robust enough to handle that many people simultaneously? Right. Let me even yeah. ask a simple question too, because I'm hearing a lot of people viewing it from remotely. You know, we've definitely had um, cases where people are using this to just monitor their production line, making sure materials moving across it. Am I going to get a big delay when I'm viewing it on my smartphone? Is it going to be... Um, if I'm all, you know, something, if I'm viewing it remotely, is that something I can do? You know, what kind of delay am I going to be looking at with that kind of stuff? And so will we will delay. get a delay. The extent of it, I think, is a, a function of how many stops that data has to make and what the upload speed is. It's not instantaneous. I know Ben or Matt, if you have more specific numbers about what that delay range is. Yeah, uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to depend on the network infrastructure that you have to uh, go through in order to deliver this video to whoever's watching it. So how many switches are in the way, how many different networks, et cetera. But in an ideal, very simple environment, it's going to be sub one second. It's going to be very, very fast. Um, you're going to see stuff that is pretty darn close to real time. Um, certainly, you know, as good or as better as anything else out there in the market. On the flip side, if you set up your network in a really convoluted way, you get 12 switches it's got to go through and it's got to go jump to a VPN over a corporate and then come back down to you. Uh, that could take a really long time. Um, so it is a little and bit of a really long stuff. time, we mean several seconds. Yeah, yeah, like two, yeah. two yeah. seconds, three seconds. Two, three. Mm -hmm. um, in it, you know, long time from a, a real time perspective. Yeah. Not a from long a, time. From a monitoring your production line perspective. Yeah. Right. Um, where that's where we should. Where would be the least amount of delay if that's something that is camera direct. straight to NVR straight to direct a from machine. Direct yeah. yeah, you're going to have way less than a, a sub one second if you're looking at the monitor that's connected to it. Matt or Ben, you had started to talk about a specific use case a few minutes ago, and I kind of want to hear what you're going to say. They needed several stations. Uh, yeah, they needed the ability to. They were monitor using cameras to monitor their production lines in different mm -hmm. parts of the production line, and in each area where they were monitoring the production line, they have a foreman that looks at a monitor with the camera views, verifying and making sure everything is still functioning properly. And that is what ensures the production line is working seamlessly from end to end. Um, you know, if one foreman notices something off on one of their cameras from looking at that monitor, they can push a button that, you know, alerts a light, the other foreman see that light, they start slowing the machine down, right? And now things can start kind of working together all from the use of a video standpoint. Um, and that's why I think it's important to consider what your needs are. If your needs are to monitor a production line, you don't want a delay. We're gonna recommend you set up a you know, local direct to machine viewing setup. Um, but if you're trying to monitor just generally general coverage and how things are going overall at the facility, then yeah, maybe you can use the you know view station software. Um, the or, the chief safety officer idea it doesn't really matter if it's three seconds delay for that. Exactly. You know, one of the other topics I did want to bring up too um, is retrofitting. Um, you know, some places are going to already have pre-existing cameras, and I know a lot of them are analog cameras. Um, are those just rip and replace? Can they use some of those? Uh, what what options do they have yeah. for that? I mean, you can't. You can't reuse the cable for an IP camera. I mean, <clears throat> technically you can. Lots of things you can do. It's a very terrible idea. You don't want to do it. Um, well, the re reliability of that is not an option. Let me ask um, too, uh, sorry to interrupt, but how would I know if I'm a manufacturing plant owner and I'm looking to 
upgrade my video surveillance system or even add on mm -hmm. to it? How would I know if I even have analog or is there an easy way? I mean, to one of the or... easy options is looking at the cabling and maybe you can throw some some icon, some pictures up here in a second, because um, BNC cabling looks very, very different than um, IP cabling. You know, your your Cat five cable is going to look like what you plug into your computer for the network. BNC, it's it's big, it's fat, it's round. It looks like I, something you'd plug your TV in if you were uh, nineteen eighty. Yep. Um, I'll also say you can tell by looking at a monitor of the camera mm, views. Yep. You know, if, mm -hmm. if it starts to look like you're underwater a little bit on the actual view <laughs> on the on the screen. That's a sure tell sign that that's a analog cable. Which kind of dials us back to the, can you retrofit it? Can you, yes, should you? Probably not if you're investing right. in that in that system. I mean, we do have uh, um, you know, a device called a corporal and, and we're not the only ones who carry something similar that can basically encode that analog signal and transition it to our MBR or network video recorder. So you can still view that analog camera alongside of your IP cameras. There are some situations where that makes sense. Um, but generally it's not worth it. So you're not gonna reuse the cable. Generally, you're not gonna reuse the camera. Um, yeah. Technology is, is super outdated. If things break and the cameras go down, you're not gonna be able to repair, likely not gonna be able to replace it. Yeah, repairing them is, is rough. There's a lot more to troubleshoot in terms of the power as well. Mm -hmm. So what I'm hearing is yes, it's possible, but maybe only if you absolutely have to for not just maybe budget reasons, but potentially, hey, how am I actually even gonna access that cable while we're open? Maybe they're a manufacturer plant that's open 24 hours a day. That might be difficult for them to stop production. So, hey, we can still get these analog cameras working with you. Yeah. And eventually, hopefully the plan is to get them to IP and you know get all the benefits of IP with that too. It's um, also easier than you think uh, to take an analog cable uh, that, you know, is run through the wall and pull a little bit out, tape an uh, IP camera to it. I hate when people say that. It's not that Our easy. install team would be screaming at you, Our Matt. install team hates when you say They'd that. They'd be like, what? <laughs> Why'd you say that? We're to get this combative in this environment. But <laughs> nah. yes, sometimes you can do that. It all depends on how that cable was installed to begin with. If it is properly secured, if it's secured anywhere close to code, which is every, I think it's four feet or so, at least it is for, for um, Cat5, there's no way you're pulling that. You need to go and clip every zip tie or every J hook. So that's not, it, I think some people go, oh, I've got coax already, half the job's done. And we end up having to have this really difficult conversation with them that's basically the technology is outdated and so is your cable and it's not really work you can repurpose. Yeah, well, and that brings up the bigger point too of uh, installation from a professional security company like ourselves versus, you know, no offense to Jim Bob, but Jim Bob security company, right? <laughs> um, you know, th there's vast differences in how we are going to approach the project and the standards that we uphold ourselves to. And so we're going to mm -hmm. talk about a system, whether that be retrofitting or installing a net new one, as though those standards were met, because that's how we, you know, for us to touch it, that's what we're going to assume mm -hmm. is the case, mm -hmm. which is why I would argue also to Matt and Micah's point that technology is extremely outdated. Uh, resolution was exponentially lower. Um, you needed many more cameras in an analog system to cover the same area one IP camera mm -hmm. could cover. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you're, you think it might save you to reuse these cameras. But I can guarantee you in the long run, over the next year and a half of you owning the system, it will cost you more in repair, service calls, downtime, you know, not to mention any things that you miss. And I would just say from the from the install perspective, there's a little bit more coordination often around like access to space. You're thinking about like, when can I go in and out of certain spaces? Uh, frequently, you've got really high ceilings. So you're often needing mm -hmm. a lift, which adds some expense. Um, you also frequently have high ceilings with different things going on in the ceilings. So we end up having to really consider, you know, does the camera, the camera can't hang directly on the ceiling probably. It probably needs to be dropped down. How far does it need to be dropped down? Um, and asking a lot of those questions on site. 
size of the facility will also add some complexity and some expense because you know if you're running 600 feet of cable versus 150 feet of cable that's a very different labor calculation and then you compound it with I have to walk from one side of the building to the other side of the building and back um, for mm -hmm. tools and supplies and um, it just it's it's a more complex planning process and project management process and often requires coordination with someone on site who can help you know traffic control you know when can I go where when can I not go where so that you don't end up paying for labor time where people are just sitting around and not able to do work because they can't get to where they need to do the work. I would uh, I would float up another sort of consideration with some tests that has to do with action with with the chemicals that you might have to use. Um, and you know if you're dealing with some sort of chemical that could potentially be uh, an issue, uh, we probably need to know about that so that we can recommend the, the right product. So we might recommend, so for example, a camera with a glass dome, uh, and then you might you know bring up a sort of chemical issue that that's absolutely the wrong solution. It might fog up all the time, uh, or it might corrode or something like that. Um, and so we've got different solutions that we can recommend uh, depending on what sort of uh, you know chemical solutions or aerosols or, or whatever that you have to deal with. Um, the last thing that that uh, I kind of find kind of funny um, and and interesting to bring up is uh, I was over at uh, the um, uh, the safety conference five years ago uh, and in dealing with a lot of of chief safety officers and they talked about wanting to not record so there wasn't any proof of uh, uh, violations uh, and I want to point out how crazy illegal that sort of admission is. Uh, especially at a safety conference, um, this you know it's 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 expected now. Um, you know that that you have recordings everywhere. Uh, that sort of uh, viewpoint of uh, well, I can't you can't prove that I knew it uh, is is never going to fly in you know today's day and age. Uh, you need to have the proof. Um, mm -hmm. You know, ignorance is not a uh, ignorance is an admission of guilt at this point. <laughs> No, absolutely not. And on the flip side of that, though, too, I have seen and worked with uh, several clients who actually get discounts on their monthly premium from their insurance companies for having, you know, certain amount of days of high quality recorded um, footage mm -hmm. on hand. So there's always yeah. just some things to consider. Sounds like we covered a lot when it comes to manufacturing. Um, if you have any questions and you want to learn more, definitely reach out. QR code up here. Go to getsw.com. We'll be happy to get the ball rolling on access control, video surveillance, answer any questions you might have. Um, I want to thank the awesome panel for joining me again on this one. And I look forward to the next episode. Bye-bye. Bye, guys. Thanks, everyone.